Um, Mick. Hi. Welcome to the interview for recordproduction.com and Resolution Magazine. You've got such a wide ranging career. You've worked with so many artists in so many studios. What inspires you now when you, when you sit down and think of all the... I mean, is it still the reference point of the actual musicians playing oh, yeah, in the room? Much. Well, that and and sense of arrangement. Because, we, I mean, it's not, it's not a matter of reproducing what's happening in the room. And we are making records, we're yeah. not making recordings. You know? We're making records. So, it's, yeah, what inspires me is still that, that thing of what makes a record sound great. And that's, a, that's one word that deals with all aspects of a record, not just the sonic aspect, aspect but its impact, its emotional, its emotional um, communication, its, its, its expression, the lyrics, the, the performance of the singer, the melodies, the arrangement, all of those things are still there and still work in the same way. So, um, and I'm still hearing, you know, I listen to the radio every day, still hear stuff which inspires me to, to go and do things differently. And I still check out what other people are doing. And I still read interviews myself, you know, and think, oh, that's interesting. I better try that next time. <laughs> because that's, you know, it's the uh, same as it's ever been. You know? Yes, you've you've always had a reputation for pushing the pushing the boundaries of of recording techniques. Oh, I really? Oh, yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. Mm. I think Dave Ruffy said that. Did he really? Yeah, that's very <laughs> nice of him. <laughs> so recently, actually. Really. Oh, well, that's good. I yeah, what did I do on the right time? That was basically boundary pushing. I must have done something, but yeah. No, it's it's a matter of just looking for new things. Because there's such a lot of stuff out there. You you have to think in terms of making records that have got something that's original. That's a very English thing, I think, anyway, to think about being original anyway, but with, with music and lots of different art forms. But I think in terms of the way records sound, the way you go about things. And that, that thing about, you know, if you could create a something sound-wise that's happening in the studio, then that inspires the performer as well. You know, if you make something sound a certain way which they didn't expect, then that can stimulate a particular kind of performance and give the performance an edge. And essentially, you know, when the listener listens to a record, it's essentially the performance they're listening to. You know? I mean, I, the people I know who aren't in the industry don't tend to talk to me about sounds. You've got to do something very extreme sonically with a record for the average guy in the street to go, oh, that sounds different. Essentially, they're listening to the performance, they're listening to instruments and singers, and then that's what gets through to them. So that's, that's the thing you, you need to spend a lot of time stimulating when you're producing records. So it's like a virtuous circle between the sound that you're making and... Oh yeah. I guess that's kind of like why, why I was talking before about... I like the idea of when you're creating, say, a guitar sound with use, using certain effects, then I like to record that sound because because it's there for all the other work that gets done after that. You know, whoever's singing or playing other parts is hearing the character of that sound. You know. So yeah, absolutely. It's a stimulus. Is there, is there maybe a sense though that in the tools that we're using now, it's a bit like kind of word processors or something. There's so many features in them that, whereas before, with the analog gear, it was designed for a particular targeted process. Oh yeah, but we always found bizarre ways of using things in the ways we weren't supposed to. You know, using distortion on vocals, even then, because you know. And this Give ever since Joe, of well, and well, I mean, the records that are happening now, Muse, um, who else? Uh, PJ Harvey, um, Bowie, to a certain extent. You know. Distortion is different sorts of distortion, but different. I mean, these things came from the people they worked with. You know, um, but uh, well, I'm not sure with Muse, actually, I think they use a lot of those techniques live. Um, but it's kind of maverick sense, you know, you're presented with this this piece of gear, or we've designed this as a new idea for you to use, and it does this, it does phasing, or it does distortion or something. So I think uh, most most engineers and producers have this sort of, you know, maverick sort of idea, well, let's, let's think about using something different, and let's turn the knobs all the way. I know we're not supposed to, but let's see what it sounds like. You know. Trying to find new ways of doing things, so, so you abuse the equipment to, 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 um, to do that. Um, but 
But yeah, it's, I mean, it's the creative process. You, know, you want to do something new all the time. And get, things get boring if you're doing the same way. I mean, I, I deliberately look for different ways to mic up drums, for example, these days, because I've recorded so many drum kits where you have two kick, two kick mics, two snare mics, and mics on every tom, a hi-hat mic, all close mic, and then two sets of ambience mics, and you just set it up, and it's 10 tracks, 12 tracks, whatever. Uh, it's just boring to do it the same way. So <laughs> where have you got to now? Oh, well, uh, Glyn Johns? Uh, interesting, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Where are you at? Pull the now? mics. Well, well, the last thing I did, I think, uh, I think I used two kick drum mics. One top snare mic, one overhead. The hi hat mic was about ten feet away, uh, and some room mics in a couple of funny places. No mics on the toms. It's just a matter of you have to be aware of doing things automatically and then stop doing that because you do. Quite often, if, if you're an engineer on a session, you're presented with a certain amount of time, and, and sometimes you have to play it safe, because you have to not play it safe, but you have to do something that you know is going to work, mm -hmm. because you haven't got time to experiment. But when you do have time to experiment, I think you just have to deliberately steer yourself away from the things that, you've, that you know work, just to force yourself to do something different. So that's the only way new stuff's going to happen, it's like the Studio 2 drum sound. And, you know. What were the milestones for you? Oh my goodness, milestones. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky to, to, to have worked with two artists of whom I was, before I worked with them, a, a great fan, which is Frank Zappa and Bo Morrison. Wide-ranging musical styles, of course, but I mean, I, I love what they, I had listened to their albums and bought their albums for several years before I worked with them, so they're, they're probably the two biggest milestones, I think. I've met Van, I've recorded him oh, really, briefly. Okay. And I mean, he has got a reputation as being somewhat demanding, as has the other artist you mentioned, Frank. Mm. And in different I mean, ways, is that is that something that I mean, you also perhaps have a reputation as being <laughs> <laughs> a demanding taskmaster? You'll have to speak to people I work with. I'll be your assistant. <laughs> well, for, uh, for all kinds of different reasons. I mean, Van has a reputation for being demanding, but essentially. I don't find that demanding. I mean, he just wants the job done. That's all it is, which is, uh, and fast. I mean, th from a musician's point of view, that means you have to recognise what the job is yeah. and then be capable of doing it and then doing it without without messing around too much. And as long as you get to the point and get on with it, that's, that's uh, and if that's demanding, then I think everybody should be like that. I mean, it's, what can you say? It's, yeah. Were they demanding of you, or uh, is Van demanding? Van, of not you? particularly. No, as long as you, as long as you. I mean, the, the thing is, okay, well, I guess it's a, a, what's what's demanded is a certain degree of intuition. You need to kind of look at, you need to understand the way he works, and realize that he wants it to happen quickly. Because if you're improvising, if you if you hang around, it doesn't happen. You know, you, that's where you've got to get the first takes. Because it's never going to happen again in a lot of cases. John Dunn is a classic example of that, although he did do two tanks, I think. Um, but also, so from my point of view, I make a point of making sure the studio environment is conducive and enabling to that process. Because he just wants to walk in, he's got millions of other things he wants to do, he wants to walk in, perform the song, and go out and do something else. He you know? doesn't want to hang around. So you've got to set everything up so that, that can happen. So the first thing you do is make sure he doesn't turn up until 4 in the afternoon and make sure the band turns up at 10 o'clock in the morning. So at least you have a fighting chance to get sounds and headphones and everything together. Or longer than that, if possible, you know, a day if you can. Um, because then he can. Then you know you're ready and you're not stressed you know, because you've got it all prepared. Also, I mean, having done it before means you know what you're up against. So if you make sure it's all prepared and you know that when he walks in, he can walk through the door into the control room, into the studio, pick up the mic and, pl and play and sing, and you've got it, then that's what he wants. So as long as you can do that, then you know, that's, that's what it's about. So yeah, I guess you have to have the, the understanding to realise that that's what's necessary. Yeah. Do you have your own assistant now? Or no. I'm no, no. You have a, I think it was... Um, Steve Powell? No, it was Alan oh, Douglas said... Uh, oh, right. Mix a demon. Did he really? Yeah. All oh, right. I think it would so I thought he means by that, but <laughs> no. I, sure. I mean, I, I suppose that's fairly demanding. But I mean, it only stems from from having a certain certain standards, and you know, which I, put, I impose on myself. I guess you know, I want to I want to achieve something, and sometimes you have limited time and resources with which to do that. 
So that's a challenge. I mean, I like that challenge myself. I like being under pressure because it brings something out of me, I think. And I guess there's a sense in which that probably gets transferred to the people who are helping me do that. Yeah. Um, but it's, I like to work at a certain pace as well. I like to, to keep things moving and turning over because I just I, I enjoy that, that sense of getting there. Um, and so I guess people around you are helping you do that have got to be on the, on the case. They've got to be quick and they've got to realise what's required and, and be able to do it. So I suppose if that's demanding, that's, yeah. that's what it is. I mean, it, it's a mentality that a previous generation of musicians also had, but how do you find it with musicians today? I mean, they're much more aware of all the possibilities and recording processes. Are they? Do you find there's a sort of less of an edge there? I don't think so, no, I don't think so, because I think if you're, well, talking about bands, for example, I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if you put a band together, it's because it's, it's an attraction of like-minded musicians, four or five people, who, who get something out of writing and performing together, and that's still the same, that's still getting together in a room, picking up instruments and microphones, and performing a song in a live sense. I mean, you know, gigs haven't really changed that much. Uh, you still get up on the stage and you know, in front of an audience, and you've got to deliver. You know, there's no real, in spite of the technology that exists in studios now, there's no real substitute for having to deliver that on stage. And uh, to me, that's still the essence of what a live band's about. So when you go into a studio, to, that's still a reference point for me. And so when I'm working with a band, you know, we start in a rehearsal room, kick around the song, do pre-production as it's called, blah, 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 blah. Go in the studio, it's, it's still, that's still the origin of what you do. You set the band up live, and and I, I suppose I make a demand on them. I mean, if, if I came across musicians in a band who were aware of the technology, that, that the safety net that they've got yeah. now, say, and who wanted to exploit it, I'd probably discourage them from doing that. You know? yeah. I could probably encourage them to well, it's, I have done, in fact, you know. but I think, I think musicians respond to that. Anyway. It is this kind of theme that some producers, uh, you know, in the resolution interviews, there's been comments about the proliferation of tracks, of, you know, receiving these huge things to mix where everybody oh, has yeah. deferred the decision. It's That's a track, yeah, if you've got to do that, sure. But if you're, if you're, if you're mixing and you're on the receiving end of that, I mean, there, there is an upside, I suppose. You have a tremendous, it depends how much time you've got. You may find stuff that, you know, yeah. is actually diamonds in a rough type of thing, you know, that, uh, material that's, that you didn't expect. But yes, you've got to spend time going through it, and that's, uh, that's a danger, I guess. I mean, I've always liked to re make decisions early anyway. I just, I like to move forward with the yeah. session. And I, to be honest, 90%, when I go into the studio with a band, I've already got a, a mental picture of the theme of what we're doing anyway, and the process is achieving that. You know, it's, Sure, I'd say 90% because you've got to leave room for, not that you've got to, but it's advisable certainly to leave room for the, all the sort of spontaneous things that can happen in the studio. But in terms of you know, the way a particular song is going to end up, it's pretty much, in my mind, I like to have that before I go in almost, you know. So the idea of having all kinds of stuff lying around, I mean, it's just it's distracting. You know? Let's make a decision, let's do that. I like recording instruments with effects, for example, you know, maybe in separate tracks, but at least with effects so that musician can hear what they're creating with that sound and it's there in the mix and stuff, you know, leave it all to later. So, I, yeah, I don't tend to go for that. But maybe it's, but that's, I'm old school, you know. I yeah. From, I come from when you only had 16 tracks and you had to make decisions, but yeah. I think it's a healthy thing. But most people are saying that, I think. Do you find it kind of surprising or pleasing maybe that, I mean, a lot of younger music, very young musicians are now referencing the 70s, you know, maybe bands or tracks like, um, I mean, magazine mm. shot by both sides, or Southern Death Cult, mm. which you also did, mm. which have maybe been forgotten for a decade, or ignored, or brushed away, and suddenly these really the young guys, from, yeah, the gems from the vault, <laughs> yeah. bringing them out yeah. and, and using them as references. Right. That's great. Sure. I mean, if uh, it's difficult to know if there's a sort of an overall sense in which that will always happen. I mean, I suppose. I mean after a certain period of time, and I suppose that varies depending on which sort of art form one's talking about, that after a certain period of time, work achieves cult, vintage, antique status, uh, perhaps. You mentioned Van, I don't think 
I plan to get to him so soon, but <laughs> he looms large because he's done, I think, 13 albums. I think he's about that. 15 now, actually. 15. Yeah. Yeah. And you're now uh, putting together a box set, I think, of his. Well, that's, it's an ongoing thing. I mean, his that's, life work. Yeah, well, it's. A, a lot of a lot of tapes arrived back at the, at the wall hall about probably about fifteen years ago, which I guess he's only become entitled to the rights of whatever. You know, yeah. They've been in the states for a long time, and these were all the tapes, all the sessions he'd, ever, he'd, he'd done over a long period, presumably, this including the Burt Bang ones. Oh no, 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 no not that far back. No, I, th I think it's Warner's yeah. stuff, you know, seventies, eighties, uh, and a lot of that was mixed. At that time, it came out as the Philosopher's Stone album. Um, but pretty much everything else has been mixed now. I spent a fair amount of time doing that, which is, which is, which was extremely enjoyable. I mean, it's, there's some great stuff, and great bands, great playing, great performances. No, but essentially, it, it seemed to be songs that were that were performed during various album sessions at the time that just didn't make it to the albums. Yeah. But that's not to say they weren't good enough. They were just more than was needed and so there are a lot of great songs there but in terms of when you say an ongoing box set who knows I don't know you know it may not see the light of day that's something to, to be discussed as it were dot 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 I mean who, who knows but there's there's a lot of very good stuff there which was which was fabulous fun to work on because it was it was just great to, to hear and and also to hear when you put on the multi-tracks the tapes running the whole time as it always has been so you're hearing conversations so you're getting the atmosphere of what's what's happening in the studio. So it's it was interesting. A lot of the, a lot of the tapes were unlabeled, so there was a lot of detective work went on. And Van's memory is incredible. I mean, we we talk about a particular session, and he would remember all the musicians. I mean, I had no idea. I, I could tell from some of the voices. I mean, I know David Hayes, the bass player, very well. I could recognise his voice. One or two other people, but he was he was right there with all the names of all the people that worked on stuff 30 years ago. So it's. But there's a lot of great stuff, yes. I can remember looking at a picture of you in um, Studio Sound, probably it was, and sitting in front of the new board at the Manor. Oh, yeah. Oh, at the Manor, was it? Yeah, oh, that's right. when I was in some toilet eight track recording a <laughs> punk band, thinking, that's the guy I want to be there. <laughs> I mean, how did it feel to be involved? Because the Manor and the Townhouse were very much at the cutting edge then. They I guess so. Yes, I mean, it, it was great fun. Um, I mean, I was still learning. You know, I'd only been engineering when I was at the Manor, which was '76. I'd only been engineering probably for four years. Still wondering, you know, was I any good? And still kind of learning about what to. I'm still learning now, you know, and that's not false modesty. I still, you know, I'm still checking out new stuff all the time because technology enables us to, to do new stuff. You know? um, now the the Manor was great. I mean, it was it was a unique house, had a tremendous atmosphere. Um, and some great acts went went through the studio. Was there a conscious attempt to kind of push the push studios more in the direction that you wanted for the sound? Because I mean, before studios have still been designed a little bit by men in white coats, if then later modified by yeah. the people that worked in them. And here yeah. you guys were. You were actually working. You were actually the engineers, the producers. Mm. It wasn't a conscious attempt to be cutting edge. We just wanted it to be really good. But that leads us on to the SSL conversation. Yeah. Because there were two studios here, and um, we decided to put in Helios in Studio One. But for ages, Phil and I sat around trying to decide what to put in Studio Two because we wanted something different. It was that idea of offering clients a choice and you know, different sorts of consoles. And essentially, at that time, there was a choice between Neve, Kadak, MCI, and, and Harrison. I think that's all there was, pretty much, of the sort of the main contenders. And although they were all good consoles, Phil and I both weren't terribly knocked out with the idea of having one of those consoles. So we, we, we must have spent six months trying to think about what to do with Studio 2. Sitting around the kitchen table at the manor thinking, well, you know, we've got everything else sorted out. What are we going to put in Studio 2? And there was a guy called John, I can't remember his surname, who was doing <laughs> weekend maintenance at the manor. His day job, his weekday job, was working at Stonesfield for what was the, well, I presume it was called Solid Technology then, I guess so, but he was working for Colin. And he'd been rabbiting on about these consoles. He was saying, I really fancy, we really should check out these consoles. And we go, yeah, yeah, John, never heard of these people. You know. <laughs> uh, go away. But in the end, I mean, he was saying, you know, they, they use really good components and it's really well laid out and it's got this and it's got that. 
in the end we thought, oh well, what the hell, let's, let's just check it out. So Phil and I, and Barbara as well, we all went to meet Colin at Stonesfield. And we just sat down and had a chat and he just described the console. Um, describe the channel strip and we seem to have everything in the right place and because you know we accept that now but you know one of my complaints about Neve then was ergonomically things just weren't sat right in the channel strip things you had to get up to do it things. was made for the classic picture wasn't well, it well I, I suppose <laughs> so yeah but just ergonomics was, was something that hadn't been refined and Colin just seemed to have a, a good sense of that the way he was describing the channel strip and then he started talking about compressors and gates at every channel oh, this is interesting and the layout and 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 the, the the tape remote situation. The fact you had master tape controls in the center and you had a ready and monitoring tape machine in out monitoring controls and a ready switch in every channel. I mean this was revolutionary. There weren't any console manufacturers in nineteen seventy seven, seventy eight who had tape machine remotes in the desk. I mean, maybe there were some Helios consoles that did but they were custom, but certainly not on a Neve or a Harris or an MCI as far as I know. Know. So that was, and it did make monitoring in the headphones. I mean, it made it quite a tricky balance between the returns and everything. People not hearing themselves. Well, I mean, he, Colin invented Super Q. The yeah. fact that the musician could hear what they just played and play along with it and hear what they're about to play before you got to a punching point. If you roll the tape back, normally they could either hear what they were playing live, the input to the console or to the tape machine, or what was coming back, what they just played. They couldn't hear both at the same time. And Colin's just out of his own sense of intuition, having worked at the studio they had at, at Acorn, was it called Acorn? Yes. Yeah. He just thought, well, that'd be a good idea. So he built it in. And I mean, to me, that's a revolutionary thing, which we now take as take for granted, and everyone else has emulated. And an auto cue. You stop the tape, and, and the talkback comes on. I mean, it's just brilliant. It? Such a simple idea, but nobody had done it. So all of these came. So by this time, I was pretty much sold on the idea. And then he started talking about the automation system. And as I said before, we'd been used to using the Allison 65K, or there were several others that worked on the same principle of, of data, which was recorded analog on two spare tracks on a multi-track. You bounce backwards and forwards. You did go. you bounce or did you punch in? Oh, you couldn't punch in on the automation. As far as, oh, did, did you try it? <laughs> I never tried it, actually. Yeah. Um, no, we, we just do a pass. You know. yeah. But you can only keep two versions of the mix. Yeah. And the time delay, I mean, it was, it was the, the eighth of a awful. second, I think, the worst case. So by the time you'd been through a five or six hour mix, you had to go back and redo all the cuts because they're all coming in and out late. And it was, yeah, pioneering days and all that. So here was a system that was tied to, to time code, which we hadn't used before. And, yeah, worked. And you could keep all these mixes. And, and it was an auto locate system as well. Yeah. I mean, that, the, it was just a, a mega leap forward in sophistication. Where are you headed now then, Mick? Me? What, what's oh, on your horizon? Well, for this get year? the studio up and running. Um, the next couple of projects I'm doing is the singer-songwriter from Scotland called Talitha McKenzie, who's done an album which was produced by Chris Burkett, who you may have met. I don't know. Uh, he has a studio in France where he did that. Anyway, I'm mixing that. That's the first thing I'm mixing in my new room. And uh, there'll be some additional production as well, some sounds and a little bit more playing. And I've got a similar mixing project for a German jazz sax player called René Decker, uh, who's doing an album which is produced by a blues guitarist that I know, uh, Tino Gonzalez. So I'll be mixing that. And he's also got a number of quite eminent players and singers. He's got Courtney Pines playing on it, apparently, and uh, Leanne Carroll's going to sing on it, um, which may be recorded in my new room. I don't know. It's, it's up in the air at the moment. We'll see. But I last spoke to Tino about it. He said there's a possibility they might do that here rather than go to Germany. So that's the next two couple of things. With such a catalogue in, under your belt, as it were, or under your fader, do you find that artists come to you and kind of like mention past work or...? Surprisingly little, actually. I mean, no, they, no, it's... that it doesn't happen that often. They might refer to a certain sound. Yeah. But, I, yeah, I, I don't know what that is. I, maybe because... Well, if you want to be creative in an original sense, the last thing you want to do is admit that you're actually influenced by somebody else's work. So there's perhaps a reluctance to want to say, I want the hi-hat sound from that album, or whatever it is, you know. Although some people don't, you know, don't have such, such qualms. But, uh, no, it doesn't have to be that much. 